All right, guys. Hopefully, it looks like you guys can hear me okay. We're going to go ahead and get started as people come in. Today, let me see if I can. I need to share the screen here. That's probably important. And let's do that. Perfect. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about seismic considerations for your resistance grinding systems. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, civil engineering uh, requirements when it comes to buildings. Uh, we're not really going to go into those today. We're not going to go too civil. We're going to go as civil as we have to as an electrical engineer trying, trying to figure out how you specify a resistance grinding system in a seismic environment. So let's go ahead and get started. I probably need to make that picture a little bit, a little bit smaller. It's a little scary. Sorry about that. My name is Chris Small. Uh, I'm post lever application engineer, regional sales manager. Been that way for about 12 years here now at post lever. I uh, graduated with an electrical engineering degree from the Ohio State University. Don't get mad at me, Rob, for saying the in front of the Ohio State. It's just the way it, it's the way it works. Um, so let's 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 just get into it. We don't have to worry about me anymore. What topics are we reviewing today? Um, so we're going to just talk about. I'm not going to do a large review today. I, I always do a review in resistance grounding just because I want to make sure people who don't know or have or have a vague idea at least get some some grounding. No pun intended. When it comes to uh, a review. Um, but we're, it's going to be fairly short. We're going to, it's going to be more of a, um, a why do you use resistance grounding rather than like a, a more technical analysis. And then seismic introductions, definitions, uh, determining your design, the adherence, and then uh, some miscellaneous stuff as well. So starting off, we have our three-phase power system here. Uh, resistance grounding. The goal of resistance grounding is to take the best of an ungrounded system and the best of a solidly grounded system, by the best, I mean the best characteristics, and kind of eliminate the worst of those two. That's, that's, the, that's a broad idea of what resistance grounding is. Technically, it's literally a resistor between neutral and ground in series, whereas this would be, if this was a solidly grounded connection, you wouldn't see a resistor here. It would be a straight line, and if you had an ungrounded connection, there would be nothing in, of this ground whatsoever. So, how we do it, how we kind of play the best of, of both worlds, um, is we first of all we still have a solid ground connection. So, where, for example, this is a this is an alternate ground path. This is called your system's capacitance. This is a ground path no matter what you have in your system because your all the systems have all electrical systems have inherent capacitance uh, between phases uh, phase of ground etc. This is a, obviously we're talking about phase of ground in this situation, but that is a um, non-intentional ground fall path. So if you had an unground system, it, the only ground fall current that would flow would be through here, and not to get too far into the weeds, but if you had the intermittent ground fall here. You could potentially over voltage as you charge this capacitance as you go back and forth. Um, so, um, so, so with the resistance grounding here, you don't have to worry about that because the, you also have a discharge path here. So, where you're charging here, potentially you'd be discharging here. So, as long as it's sized correctly, we're not going to go over those details today, but as long as it's sized correctly, that, that takes care of your over voltage issues. As far as over current, in our flash, our blast is blast issues. Uh, we have ohms law v equals ir. So current is inversely proportional to resistance. So if you put a resistor here, you're obviously increasing the resistance of the system, and therefore you're decreasing the potential ground fall current. Because a lot of you are engineers, uh, you, and you know that resistors are manufactured. Uh, at least most are. There's some natural resistance, obviously, but. Um, you can essentially dictate what your ground fall current is. You're, you're manufacturing your ground fall current. So we can low, lower this uh, current enough that you have a much less uh, problem with 
both high currents and arc flash, arc blast. We'll talk about that in more detail here. So let's talk about just the benefits of resistance grounding uh, before we move on. So there's really two different types. There's your low resistance ground and your high resistance ground. Your low resistance ground is defined as, it's loosely defined, but basically I would say anywhere where your ground fault let through current or the current that your resistor lets through on a, on a fault is anywhere between 25 and let's say 1200 amps. Your typical values are gonna be 100 amps, 200 amps, 400 amps. Those are gonna be your typical values. And this usually, a, a, you're tripping on a fault. You're, so um, when we talk about low resistance ground, that's what we're talking about. And these are kind of the benefits of low resistance ground. You have personnel safety, you have, obviously you have lower um, you have lower ground fault currents. You also have potential protection from stray ground uh, uh, currents as well. You have equipment protection. Obviously, if you have several thousand amps pot potential or a thousand amps potential, whatever the number is going to be on your salt on a, on a, a would be solidly ground system, you have much less because once again you're designing the ground fault current in your lower resistance ground. So therefore, your equipment's going to see much less current flowing through it and you're gonna have extra protection there. The, the last one is, or the first one, depending on how you look at it, is relay coordination. Um, it's the same idea of equipment protection. Because you have a lower ground fault current, you're able to trip more slowly. So this is relatively speaking, we're, talk, we're usually trip talking cycles or milliseconds, um, but it's still much more slowly than what you would say, for example, in a very large, ground fault current with thousands of amps, and you want to basically try to instantaneous trip and get rid of that current as fast as possible. Well, that can cause problems with coordination. If you have a lower resistance ground, you're much more easily able to coordinate because the current's lower, you're able to withstand that current longer, relatively speaking, and you're able to properly coordinate. Because obviously, you guys who dealt with relays don't need a long time to coordinate. You just need some time. Instantaneous is not some time. So, that's the kind of the case for a low resistance ground. And then we move on to high resistance ground. Um, so that, it's just the same, same exact idea. It's just typically defined as a ground fault let through current of zero to 10 amps. Um, that obviously, well not obviously, but that gives you equipment protection. In fact, uh, IEEE talks about how you can continuously operate with a fault safely at 10 amps or under. Personnel safety. Um, this is a, a big one. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a quick story on this. I was at, I was at a startup at a data center. I won't name which one. And I was getting into an argument between me and the, uh, let's call it the foreman. Uh, I was telling him based on my readings, I was taking measurements, et cetera, that he, he was solidly grounded. He said, of course not. And we kind of got into it a little bit. So he 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 wanted to check stuff out. I was I had my back turned. He was inside the HRG cabinet. He's I don't know what he was doing to be honest with you, but he accidentally uh, grounded one of the phases. Um, obviously he was disconnecting wires, etc. Um, but uh, it was a huge huge I wouldn't say explosion. I would say a huge noise. Um, and I, I, I honestly thought he was in big trouble because I had my back turned to him. Luckily, he had proper PPE on. He was, he was, uh, he had that protection. And if he, but if he didn't, he would have been in big trouble. There was a huge uh, mark across the entire upper portion of the cabinet because he ground that phase. So the point is, in a for a solid ground system, that's common, that's expected. For a high resistance ground system, he, he may not even noticed. Maybe a little bit, but not much. There's not. There wouldn't be the same. Obviously, not the same amount of current flowing. Uh, you're, you're not worried about those types of events as much. Obviously, if he just if he touched a live wire, I'm not talking about that. Obviously, but those types of events uh, it helps with personnel safety. We, we have have other stories about people, fires, etc., uh, caused by solid ground systems that would not be caused by HRGs. Anyway, uh, continuity of service is a big one. Really, since the 70s. High resistance ground has been used for um, processes, uh, oil and gas, water, wastewater, food, um, you know, any, everything, any kind of batch processing. Uh, and there's more today, but that's kind of historically speaking what was it was used for. Um, 
And so, the, and then the reason was this: you have continuity of service, you have the ability to continue to operate. I mentioned already, IEEE talks about safety, safety of uh, continuous operation under 10 amps. So, you know, it's just I think when most people think of HRG, they think of continuity of service and the ability to operate on fault. Um, arc flash reduction is, I would say, a newer phenomenon in, in the sense that uh, people, I don't know, I, I, should, I shouldn't say this because I don't know for sure, but it doesn't seem like people were really focused on high resistance ground and the reduction of arc flash until the last five, 10 years. Um, but it's become a huge issue. Uh, you have, essentially, IEEE talks about how if you have a ground fault on a, on a low voltage, high resistance ground, you have zero potential for an arc flash. Or our fault, either one. So um, that's a big deal. You're drastically reducing the amount of events you can have because your ground faults are typically 95 to 98% of your faults. Um, there's been papers that have been written by prominent engineers in different industries, oil and gas, et cetera, that have talked about 97% reduction in, in uh, arc flash. So it's a major reduction in terms of real world results and the ability, the um, exposure to arc flash when it comes to your personnel those are the big uh, you know benefits of resistance grounding that's all i'm talking about today in terms of review just in case you didn't know that before seismic introduction so um you know as we move on if you if you know if you look at old standards versus new standards they're becoming more stringent and part of it is because the technology has advanced we have the capability to be more safe with buildings, et cetera. Um, as we move forward with that, keeping critical infrastructure is obviously an important thing. That's the safety issue as well, but also for our industries and you know that that uptime idea, whether it be uh, you know life saving or you know just uh, critical infrastructure or whether it be just like you know industrial plant that that needs to operate to continue to produce a product. These have become more more uh, of a focus, um, and so the more there's been more stringent, uh, you know, regulations because of that. Um, so obviously, today we're just going to be talking about neutral grounding resistors. That's both low resistance and high resistance ground. Um, and so what, components are kind of a special category when it comes to um, seismic requirements. And so we're going to focus on that. So if you have any questions about buildings. I'm not, a, I'm not a civil engineer, I'm not gonna be able to help, but hopefully you guys understand that this is about um, seismic uh, qualifications, specifications of uh, grinding resistors. So let's move forward with that. So let's, let's, get, let's get some um, some terms out of the way. We have some legacy codes, we have a uniform building, it's basically U is uniform, S is Southern, N is national. Those are kind of regional, some of you may know re regional uh, codes. You know, I think UBC was Western. Obviously, Southern was Southern. I'm guessing Northern was, excuse me, National was Northwestern or Northeastern. I could, I could have been more than that. I honestly didn't look that one up. But you have these old codes. You know, it's usually dated in the, in the 60s beyond, and then so you, they kind of conglomerated with the International Code Council. They they decided to get together. Kind of, they also have different. Uh, bodies that, that were that were overseeing these things, and so they kind of all conglomerated. And at that point, the IBC was introduced, uh, the International Building Code. Uh, this was this was really started in 1997, uh, and that was the first one. Uh, you also have the AS, ASCE, which is basically IEEE, IEEE for civil engineers. Uh, they have recommendations. Usually, they're working with the IBC, uh, so. The, what you'll see is you'll see you know the IBC comes out with, with their code and the AAC comes out with their new regulations that kind of go back and forth. Uh, they, they work obviously with each other. Then you have Oshpod. Just throw us out there, number one, because it's California. It's probably the largest state in terms of seismic uh, requirements in the U.S. Uh, but also because we personally use Oshpod uh, as a um, certification uh, body. Uh, and also, you know, for some of our calculations. So um, it's, it's basically just a more strict version of IBC for uh, healthcare facilities in California. So the idea is, so if we break it down, you know, the idea essentially is, look, if you're an engineer, 
or if you're purchasing this or you know your contractor trying to figure out what you need uh you really have three options when it comes to neutral ground resistors okay you're going to either get a seismic tested unit which you can see there there's a there's a shaker table it's got it it you know does a good job of mimicking an earthquake which gives you three-dimensional you know obviously movement uh and so you can have a seismic tested unit that is your that is one of your options you could have a seismic calculated unit that's another option and obviously if you don't have if you you may be in the park where you have specifications for seismic but you, you don't actually need a special uh you know enclosure or you know just design to meet that standard so those are really your options and the goal for me today is to kind of help you figure out how to calculate and, and and where which camp you fall into so for some ground rules we're gonna i'm, I'm basically using asc 6716 which is um the newest you know guidelines from from asc that i think it's every six years so you know the one should be due hopefully if the pandemic didn't delay it uh pretty soon next year um you can also use ibc NEHRP, which is the National Earthquake Hazard Direction Program, you can use those. They have guidelines as well. I would say the, N the IBC and SC work closely together. It's very similar. Um, there, you wouldn't see much difference at all there. I'm honestly not familiar with the NEHRP as much, but I didn't do a lot of study on it because I've literally never seen a spec ever that calls that out. So it's always IBC or ASC. That's kind of why I chose to, to not highlight it as much. So let's talk about some definitions. We have this a site class, which is essentially the ground. Well, you know, what kind of dirt do you have? <laughs> essentially, you know, obviously this is important for grounding in general, but it's also obviously important for size and properties. So the the uh, more dense or the the harder your ground is, the better it's gonna it's gonna perform. Typically, in a well, it depends on which it depends on how you look at it, but it is a definitely it definitely a a consideration when it comes to seismic events. Um, I'm not. I'm going to mention it today. I'm not going to go into detail about that today. Just it's because it basically just requires a. It requires a civil engineer to do an analysis. Um, if you don't know, I mean, you can use a specific category. We'll talk about. We'll talk about that more later. Um, but you know, it's usually it's kind of um, something that's kind of out of the scope of the electrical engineer. Essential facilities, uh, buildings, and other structures that are intended to remain operational in the event of extreme environmental loading. So of all this stuff, obviously, we're talking about uh, earthquakes today, seismic events. Um, importance factor, it's, um, I mean, it's, it is what it sounds like. You know, how important are, is your equipment? Uh, what, what, uh, what, important, what, what uh, significance do you put on its operation after an event? Uh, risk category. Um, what type of building do you have? Oh, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, how much risk basically do you have, depending on what, of what, what type of structure you have? And then the seismic design categories. Kind of, these are all interrelated to some degree. We'll, we'll go through them in more detail, but I just want to inter introduce the terminology for you. Seismic design category is the classification assigned to the structure based on its risk category and other factors in terms of accelerations etc so let's 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 highlight let's let's start talking more in detail about importance factor when it comes to neutral grounding resistors so ip is an importance factor for non-building components uh, so you, if you've done if you've done seismic analysis before and you look at importance factor of buildings you'll notice that there's a lot more different uh, there's a lot uh, more of a a, a diversity in, in categories. There's like a 1.0, 1.25, 1.5. Uh, there may, may be more than that, but the point is that for components, we only have two. It's 1.5 or 1.0. There's two different requirements and there's two different things you do based on that. Um, the default, in terms of component importance factor, the default should be 1.0 in terms of requirements, unless conditions are met to be 1.5. So what does that mean? Well, so, so let's talk about some conditions for 1.5. Now, quick, quickly, let me define those to you. Um, we'll talk more about that. But basically, IP 1.5 means you are, you have a real life uh, test. 
you're able to show that the unit can operate after a real event or a simulated event, but nevertheless an actual event. And so typically that's shaker table. Um, uh, and then uh, the the other one is via calculations. But anyway, so the so the conditions for IP 1.5, there are several, generally speaking, but for our purposes, there's really only two. Uh, the component is required to function for life safety purposes after an earthquake, including fire protection sprinkler systems and egress stairways. Well, so obviously a neutral ground resistor, um, nobody's going to be worried about uh, you know whether or not that operates in terms of their life safety, unless the things that they would worry about, like lighting, sprinkler systems, anything else in terms of emergency response or whatever, is powered by it, said neutral ground resistor. So you, they may not think about it, but if it's powered by, if any of these things are powered by neutral ground resistor or the power source with the neutral ground resistor, you would probably consider that a condition for IP 1.5. Or the component is in or attached to a risk category four structure. Um, so, you know, if you, if it's assuming that you have the neutral ground resistor on the main power source or the backup power source or and something that's it's important for continuous, continuous operation. You know, if you, for some reason you have one off and it's you know do it, it's a tied to a motor that's or a few motors that's not really that essential for any, for anything. Then um, it's fair to say that's not included. But everything else, typically you're going to have a power source of the building or emergency generator of the building, and you're going to have that, uh, and the NGR is going to be tied to that. So that those would be the the conditions for IP 1.5. So the good news is that's kind of a, a, a fairly simple uh, definition in terms of what you need to, to be. We'll talk about the risk categories in a second, but first we're going to do a poll question. Um, we're go ahead and they're kind of simple today, but I, I, just, I wanted to kind of see how much experience you guys have with this kind of stuff. And also, you know, what location or what region are you in? Uh, see how much uh, in, uh, earthquake experience you guys have. So we'll wait a couple more seconds and then we'll keep going. All right, so you should hopefully, you guys saw the poll results. Um, as a note, 76% of attendees have not specified or purchased a seismic liberated NGR previously. Well, I appreciate that, guys, in, in one sense, because um, I was concerned that this was a little bit too, uh, it was a little bit too specific for an audience, but I figured most of you guys would have experience. But since I just appreciate your attendance, obviously, you want, hopefully, you want to learn something about this, and that's it's, it's, it's important if you're going to be looking at this in the future. And just as a side note, you know, California, if you live in California, you know that seismic is very, uh, very huge part of the design uh, there. And there's a few states other than that as well. But I believe that though, because of the, you know, the different uh, uh, accelerations and, and different uh, t types of categories, and also the, the, as, the, as the regulations get more and more stringent, as they naturally have been doing, you're going to see more states get involved as well. So let's talk about risk category. Um, so risk category, it's pretty simple. You have one, to, you have between category one and four. So for components non-structures, the only one to really care about is category four. So one, one through three, if you have that risk category, you're going to be an IP of 1.0. Or le so when I say that, I mean that that's what's required. Okay, based on the standard, um, we'll talk about a, a little more later. But that may not necessarily what you want, what you want as an engineer. Maybe not what you want as an engineer because there are two, a few different things, uh, differences between 1.5, 1.0. .1 so, but once again, it's the it's the standard that that you need to meet in order to do either 1.0 or 1.5. So, if you're category four, 1.5. If not, 1.0. So, what does risk category four look like? It's a, I literally copy pasted this because um, it's not too wordy, and I wanted to give you guys an exact idea of what it is. So I'm not going to reread it, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. We have 
uh, you know, hospitals and uh, urgent care facilities. Um, you have anything with emergency response, uh, earthquake, hurricane, or other shelters. It, it really, generally speaking, anywhere where if you had an event, uh, people's lives or this critical infrastructure is on the line. Okay. Uh, and then you can kind of read through the list as well. Obviously, you don't want the uh, air traffic control towers to go down when there's uh, there's aircraft in the in the air. So that's all. It, so the, once again, not too not too bad in terms of how you you define it. Look, you're either risk category four or you're not. Okay, good. We can figure, we can we can remember that one. So let's talk about seismic design category. This one gets a little more complicated. It's based on the risk category, but it also has a lot to do with the location and what you have going on and the types of earthquakes you have and the potential for accelerations, et cetera. Uh, so this one's a little more complicated. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about it a little bit generally, and we're going to go into a little more detail when we get to an example. Um, so here's some couple tables. This tells you what type of seismic design category you have. It's based off of accelerations, which is what SCS means. Once again, we'll go into that in more detail later. But essentially, depending on the numbers, uh, of accelerations, either a one second or a 0.2 second response, uh, you're going to be in a, a certain design category. So as you can see there, the numbers. And, we, and once we once we define the, the equation and how you actually come up with these numbers, you can go back and kind of make make sense of this table. But so you, you have A, B, C, or D. Your typical based off your uh, your acceleration values. Uh, but then you just have some special categories for E and F. So, so as you see there, design category E is risk category one, two, or three, where S one is greater or equal to 0.75, and that's just the, that's just the acceleration for one for uh, one second. And then uh, the risk category four, which is we we kind of went through that we we went through the, the at least the difference between four and everything else, right? So where S one is greater than or equal to 0.75. So just wanted to bring that up. And show you that here's some maps. Um, so one thing that seismic design category is based off of is what site class. We did talk about that in the definition section. Basically, the soil, what kind of soil you have. I, I don't know if they're making generalizations or they just know the type of soil. That that's the question I have with this map. They give you this is maybe a generalization, but they basically give you the design category based on your location. So this is obviously for the contiguous United States. And I have one for Alaska and for Hawaii as well. So you kind of get, you can get an idea based on maps. I'm guessing you don't want to do this based on a map per se. Uh, that's only one part of the process. Um, but this gives you a good idea of what you're looking at. It gives you a good visual, I should say, of what, what we're talking about. Um, so I, I put this in here. It's a little out of place, but I, I, the reason why I did that is because a lot of people, st I, we still receive specs. No, I shouldn't say a lot. You know, as the years go on, there's less and less. But we still see specifications where you have old seismic requirements, and they're based off of essentially what this is, which is, you know, turn of the century type of stuff uh, for seismic requirements. This is definitely obsolete. Um, if you're an engineer, I urge you not to do this. But if you're like a specifier or whatever, you can figure out specify excuse me if you're like a uh, contractor or if you're trying to procure the equipment you you can figure out what you need based on these specs anyway um, but once again you don't really want these are kind of obsoleted I just want to show you I see zone I see zones on specs all the time and not to pick on anybody but I'm pretty sure it's not because it's I'm guessing copy and paste was involved that's all I'm saying um, so just wanted to bring that up as a note but you can see here it is a little bit different than the maps we showed previously, and that's because this is 20-ish plus years old. So there are some exceptions uh, we, we need to talk about in terms of whether or not you need, for your components, you need uh, seismic requirements, uh, i.e. IP 1.0 or IP 1.5. Um, so uh, number one, if you're in design category B, and it implies A as well, because um, there's different stuff for A, but it's basically, there's, it's lesser than B. Um, 
category C with IP 1.0. So if you don't meet the threshold of IP 1.5 and you are a category C, then you're good. Um, if you're in D, E, or F, uh, you need to be IP, you can't be IP 1.0, and then you can kind of read the rest. It needs to be attached to the structure. You need to have flexible connections, and the component needs to weigh less than 400 pounds. Now, as an example, I will say, like, for example, our higher distance ground system or low voltage, that would be, if you had an IP 1.0 and you had D or F, that would meet those requirements. It has center of mass located less than, um, so you wouldn't have to worry about seismic requirement for an HRD system, at least ours. I uh, can't speak for everybody, obviously. Um, a lot of our lower distance ground systems, I don't believe, are the same. They're, uh, you know, they're, uh, I don't think we have any, but I could be wrong about that. But you get, you get, you get the idea. Uh, it has to be those, it has to meet those, those uh, certain requirements for D or F. So let's kind of get into some more detail about uh, what these things are. So I, I, I briefly talked about IP 1.5. It needs to be shaker tabled to meet spectral response for its acceleration for the site location. Um, one thing I will note is that a lot of times we get situations where, you know, customers are like, well, we have, I'll just give you an example. And this is usually when my a red flag for me goes up. Oh, we have somebody else. It's just a, usually, you know, they talk about competitors. We have a competitor that we have this unit from, and they're they're a lot less than your unit. And I'm looking at their, their where, where they're from, and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. They have to have a certain amount of bracing and steel and everything else. But there's no way. What can happen is, this is just kind of a warning, potential, or something to look out for. You can have an IP 1.5 certification, but it doesn't have to be for a specific area. It could be for, you know, it could be for like a, uh, the what you can, you know, could be, I don't know, I can't try to think of a, maybe Florida. It could be for an area that doesn't have much at all seismic activity. Um, so that's not that helpful to you. You need it to, to match the requirements. So I just want you to, to, you know, while we're going through this, I want you to make sure you understand that when you want, look for, looking for a certification for a shake table, you want to be looking to make sure it matches the spectral response parameter uh, of your, of your, your, your uh, zip, essentially zip code. Um, so this SDS is a spectral response parameter for 0.2 seconds, short, short time is what they call it, and then D1 is a spectral response parameter for one second. Those are both used to figure out what design category you are and just basically what, at the end of the day, what's going to happen. So um, I put some uh, of the equations in there. We're going to go over to exactly what they are in a second, but just give you an idea of, you know, there's... Um, there's mostly coefficients. It's not very complicated in terms, once you figure out the, the information for your area based on either maps or databases, um, you, you can figure out uh, the accelerations of a specific area and then you can kind of do some simple math and figure it all out. So it's not that overly complicated. I'll, when we go over the example, you, I think you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. IP 1.0, you need to design, calculate, and approve by a, a professional engineer. Uh, it's, I said needs to be in state. I think that's that's definitely for some states. I don't honestly know if that's for all states, but I would just make it a note to to check your state to see if the P needs to be in the, in your state. I, I would think that would be a probable yes, but I don't know for sure. I know for a fact in California that's true. Um, otherwise, you should probably check. Uh, so IP 1.0 does not. It's, it's a little different. It's not. So where you have actual experiential data, uh, 1.5, either be a test or actual event, uh, 1.0 is just a calculation, and there's some limitations to that calculation. Uh, so IP 1.0 does not guarantee that you'll be working. Okay, it does not. It only talks about. It only really calculates the enclosure uh, that it's uh, will be intact on, basically attached to its its mounting. Um, so. You know that's a big distinction. Once again, if you don't if you don't meet the requirements, you don't want you can definitely get a 1.0 unit. And but if you're an engineer and you want, not necessarily need in terms of but you want the unit to be operational, you I would recommend heavily a 1.5 unit. So that's something you want to consider if you're specifying a unit. If you want operational after an event, 
you definitely need the 1.5 because there's absolutely no guarantee and no testing done uh, for the 1.0. So here's an example. Um, I'm using this. This is this is a calculation that uh, our engineers typically do, and we do use this. I'm not uh, I'm not endorsing anyone essentially, but this is what we use. And so as you can see here, uh, first you can put in there's a, there's databases there's you know and just to be fair so the ASCE uh, 7-16 the actual standard they have if you look through um, the different chapters I believe it's chapter 21 I think I have a reference here in a second but um, it shows you maps etc and you can do it via just the just the book itself um, or you can look up a in a database such as this I will say technically speaking uh this database does not you know does not you know take any responsibility for the accuracy of this data but uh i so saw that you know maybe double check the point is this is obviously just databases based off of you know it's fairly simple maps etc and what uh, what different locations it's similar to what you saw previously uh a few slides ago so as you see here you can this is this is a still shot so i'm not gonna be able to it's not interactive but basically you, you pick your reference we pick 7 16 uh, the references I referred to previously are the ones you can cho choose. I, you know, uh, that you pick your risk category based off of our previous conversation, right? Uh, what type, type of building? What type of building it is? And then your site class. Um, once again, you might need to have an analysis done, or have a, or, ha or have a civil engineer to tell you what that is in your area. The, the code or the, uh, the, the requirement says basically. Look, if you have, if you don't know exactly what it is, you should you should default default to D stiff soil. So, um, and, you know, if, assuming that you don't have, you know, majorly different, like you're not living in the desert or something like that, uh, you know, if you don't know exactly what it is, they ask you to, to use the default of D, and that's important because that gives you different values depending on the type of soil you have. So you put your you put uh, your coordinates in in terms of you know you can put your zip code or you can put you know obviously the address here uh, for people who like Disneyland this is where that's where it's located so we're doing the uh, the Disneyland and here's what it comes out with so you basically it tells you based on the location essentially these are the values that it has right these are the values that that location has and it can do all these calculations. Uh, based on um your location so it kind of so this is something that we do when we we do the designs per you know customer call in and say look i have i live here you know soil conditions this you know and uh what what do i need essentially and so we can kind of give them that analysis if they so desire or we can just give them a, a quote for a unit that we, we think is going to work what they want We'll give them a 1.5 unit to match their their area. Uh, we, to be honest, we do we do a fairly, um, I guess I'd call it conservative. We do have a couple of different types of, of enclosures uh, in uh, NGRs that have that meet different requirements. Uh, we have a very extremely robust that can almost handle anything in the world, uh, with a few exceptions. And um, and then we have one that's uh, that's still very very good, but you know probably not uh as robust as that so so depending on where you're at we would pick the best one for for you etc so this is this is just based off of what we typically use internally it's kind of uh just to show you uh how it would how it looks um this is i use this just because um it just gives you good references so you're looking you need the SS and S1, and so when you look at the, either the maps or you look at the, just at the database that we just showed you, you can enter these values. Uh, you, you, depending on the analysis you have done, or if you just want to pick D, you can put in your site class, and obviously based on the risk category we just said, you know, what type of building you have, you can put that in as well. Um, we're not going to go into a massive amount of detail. There are I'm not giving you all the detail when it comes to ASC. I don't think I'm you're getting a good, in my opinion, hopefully, a good overview of it um, and the way to calculate it, et cetera. But there are some details that are missing just because, you know, obviously we're going to be 
we'd be here for a while if we didn't throw a detail. This is kind of like the NEC. It's or the uh, an IEEE book. It's uh, it's pretty. It's, it's it's involved, but this gives you all the references in case you want to go to see where you need to go in order to do that. This is uh, so if you have the 716 book, this is where you would go to meet these um, to look at what these things are. So as you can see here, um, okay. This is basically your raw acceleration data, and then there's some there's some uh, there's some uh, coefficients here based on uh, what kind of site class you have, and uh, so this is all calculated. This can be all calculated for you based on simple equations that I, I I just showed you. So this is uh, those these the site coefficients I just I just referenced. I did I kind of want to bring it together because we talk about site class. And um, this is based on the equation we just showed you. This is the so you look up, you get, you get this number based on your S1 or your your, short, your 0.2 second acceleration or your one second acceleration, and you can look at your site class and you can get kind of get the corresponding coefficients. And then you, once you get these coefficients, everything falls into place. Everything else can be calculated. So as you can see here, uh, this is section 11.448. Uh, when you have when you, when you get to, to these areas, you're basically you may have to do uh, a, a separate analysis, but just go to this. Go, that's, that's a whole another 10 minutes of conversation. But basically, go to this section, see if you meet the requirements, see if you meet the exemptions, and then move forward accordingly. But it, it lays it out very very easily in the book what what you need what you need to do. Let's go ahead and do. Poll question number two now. You'll never think of the people the same again. So it's split half and half between rarely if ever and some or all of the time. Okay, great. Okay, so let's talk about, okay, so if you have a rough idea or if you don't, you can go back and look. Uh, at the presentation to kind of figure out how this thing fits together. Like basically, they use the calculations. Really, first you you, you uh, figure out what your importance factor is. Number one, so probably you don't you don't need much cal you don't need to do much of anything in terms of whether whether or not you need 1.5. What type of building do you have? Does it meet the requirements that we laid out for you? If you did, then okay, here's 1.5. Okay. Otherwise. Um, uh, you, you're, and obviously, you're, what I said before is you're going to want to. That's whether or not you need 1.5 or not. However, you're also going to want to know this is complied to my specific area. So there's more. It's more involved in that. But the point is, is that, you know, you figured out what, whether or not you need 1.5 or 1.0 based off of what we talked about. What does that look like in terms of cost? This is a this is a general idea based on what I know in terms of my our manufacturer, our 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 uh, offering. And so this may not reflect everywhere, but my point is I want to give you a general idea of cost impact. Uh, if you're looking for a 1.0, this is based off, this is a markup or a multiplier based off of our standard unit, a typical standard unit. Uh, you're looking at like a, about a 1.5 multiplier for a 1.0 upgrade, okay? And you're looking for about a 2.0 multiplier for the 1.5 upgrade. Uh, you know, it's, there are, I will tell you just maybe I should so I should have showed you a picture. There was a picture earlier of the bracing that's involved. It looks our standard unit looks like a normal low resistance ground unit with just a resistor and you know just basically in, in an enclosure. And then our seismic IP 1.5, in my opinion, looks like a small version of a spaceship. So there's obviously a super bracing um, that's involved. So you need to have more material, but you also have shaker table cost. If any of you are on the uh, have been on the manufacturing side or understand the demand and also the cost of these types 
to testing, this type of testing, it's exorbitant. It's extremely expensive. It's, it's for us, it's extremely expensive. I can't imagine what it is for stuff like generators, et cetera. It's, I, I'm sure it's unbelievable. Um, but you get the point. The larger the table, the more it's going to cost. Usually for a day, it's it's uh, it's it's you know, we'll just say it's a ton. <laughs> it's it's multiple multiple units. It's like you know, ten plus times units. You know, uh, plus. So anyway. Um, so okay, so you have just our example of a certificate. So so the reason why I'm showing you this is I want you guys to understand that look, you ask for an IP 1.5 unit, uh, you should get an IP 1.5 unit, and should also get the certification that goes with it. Now a lot of you know this maybe, or but this is what you need to have, um, and this will tell you, this will confirm for you if or not, if the unit actually meets the accelerations that you need in your in your facility. I just want to give you an example. This is actually an out, probably an outdated application. I'm, uh, this has been probably renewed since since this one. However, um, just to give you an idea, it starts off as an application. Once there's there are different uh, approval certification approval authorities. Oshawa once again, like I mentioned, was was one of them. It's one of the more strict ones. We wanted to use that one, so. There we go. So this, there's a, it's about 20 plus page ap application slash certification. So uh, I just wanted to give you some snippets, but, but you can kind of see based on the, the building code um, or you know what the requirements are and the, all the IPs uh, and uh, just your different uh, data essentially. So things to know. Uh, seismic certifications, PE stamp, assume proper installation. So just, you know, you're going to need to make sure it's installed according to the manufacturer's recommendations. The recommendations are typically dictated by the certification if you have 1.5. And I'm just, there's assumptions for IP 1.0 as well. Um, make sure you're following those to comply with your certification. For example, if you you can't hit that. and this maybe this may sound at least to me it sounds obvious but um, you know if it's it didn't happen so many times I would I would mention it but it happens a lot so you sh cannot hang a unit in the enclosure there's no way to, I don't care what your unit is um, it's not hasn't been tested being swung around in an in an enclosure uh, stands are typical are typically not allowed in the sense that usually you'd have to test, or not usually, you'd have to test with these stands in order to actually pay, uh, to pass the shaker table. You could do you could do it with a, a calculation. You would drastically change your center of gravity. It would make it much more difficult. Uh, it's, I can't say it's, it's, it is doable, but it just makes it much more uh, challenging. So I would recommend if you have the ability to think this through initially, don't don't do stands or or any kind of uh, installation outside of you know concrete pad on the ground. Um, we also get the request a lot, a lot of times from uh, other manufacturers and customers. Look, I want a wall mount. I want cert I want it seismically certified. Well, once again, you can't really meet if I if I don't know what you're hanging it on. I have no ability to to tell you whether or not you're gonna, this unit's going to work after an event. So it's going to have to be an actual freestanding unit for me, for me to do that. So the, our OEM or any OEM kit or wall mount unit cannot really be certified. Oh, another thing to know: typical manufacturers IP 1.5 units are very specific. They're tested very specifically. Um, there could be ranges of product that they test, but a lot of times they have the same components. They don't they don't typically do. A bunch of different stuff internally because you know a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll try to create flexibility in, in, in a group of product. Um, for example, we have CTs that have a range of, of taps, uh, but there is you have to test it, so it's a limited. There's limited flexibility, so just keep that in mind. If you have a specific enclosure size, you have a special enclosure size, it's probably not going to work because it hasn't been tested. You're going to have to kind of work with the manufacturer. Uh, to figure out what they have that's tested and, and maybe get creative, but you're just going to be it's going to be fairly strict. Uh, for example, what we can do 
different things with our units, but, a lot, but the, for the majority of the time, it's just multiple units. You know, we, oh, we can do this value, but it's, you know, it's going to take more than one enclosure to do this. And we have to keep stick with this, the enclosure that was tested, but those types of things. Gives you a good example. Um, so in conclusion, just as a note, uh, this is this is important uh, for our, this product because a lot of times LRGs, HRGs are typically essential equipment for operation, usually tied to an emergency generator or main power, um, or, you know. And so if you're in a situation where you're a building that you need to have that, the, so for example, if you're in a, if you're in a, uh, you know. If you're in a risk category of, of uh, you know, that's high enough, typically you're going to have an LRG, HRG that's going to be needing to be IP 1.5. Uh, make sure you follow manufacturer guidelines. Once again, just mention that. Uh, you need to have, you need to make sure you do that, or otherwise the certification is useless. Uh, make sure to consider operation after event. So whether or not the the code requires it, you need to think to yourself, well, do I want this unit to work after an event? Because if I get a 1.0 there's no guarantee. In fact, I would say it's probably likely that it won't. Uh, if you get 1.5, obviously it's been tested for such. So even if you don't meet, even if you don't have to meet the requirement, you really need to consider that uh, whether or not you want the IP 1.5 for that reason. All right, so that is the end of our presentation. Um, if you guys had questions, hopefully there's some questions uh, that you guys uh, figured out throughout the presentation. We'll go over those now. If we don't get to you, we'll make sure to answer it in an email. Also, just real quick, um, there will be the option of a copy of the presentation and the video. Just go ahead and uh, ask me uh, for one. You will be getting a certification automatically via email. Um, if, you, if people don't show up, obviously you're not here, but they're going to be getting a video automatically. But for some reason, I can't automatically give you guys a video. If you're interested in one, email me and uh, I'll get you one. Thank you guys. Appreciate your time. Let's, let's do some questions. Unfortunately, Chris, most of the questions are of a very, very specific nature that we got back um, that I think will require a little more research on our part to avoid giving a flippant answer to. Okay. There were some of the particular uh, geographical areas um and specs that apply to those and then others concerning um actual physical installations of say um concrete pads or yeah so guys that's that that, that is pretty specific that would, we'd have to go to the i have to open up the open up the, the the book and and do some research on those it's not it wouldn't take more than a few minutes maybe five minutes but we can't do that now so uh we'll definitely get back to you um with those answers but yeah those are not the kind of questions we're going to be able to answer live so okay so so i guess that's it i appreciate your guys time um just keep uh keep we'll keep you posted on upcoming webinars we haven't come out with a new series yet but we'll let you know when, when that happens uh, and uh just we're looking forward to seeing you guys soon appreciate the time guys take care